turn to the book of James. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, our title of our message today is, and i got to watch my time, is faith or favoritism. Which one is it? What do we have, faith or favoritism? James chapter 2, we'll read the first few verses here. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your synagogue, is really the word, synagogue, assembly, and I'll explain why he is a synagogue. With a gold ring, dressed in fine clothes, and there is a, a poor man comes in, and he's dirty in his clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, hey, you sit here in this good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my, by my footstool, sit on the floor, basically. Have you not made a distinction among yourselves, and you become judges with evil thoughts, evil motives. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? They do, uh, don't, do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality and are committing, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law, and a you are convicted by the law as a transgressor, a lawbreaker, literally. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a breaker of the law, a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless, uh, will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Lord, in the few minutes we have together, give us your grace to understand your scripture, to put it in practice in our lives, to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Please, Lord, give us that grace and such a, such a, 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 Lord, such a simple thing on the surface, it looks like, favoritism, but such a grave sin it is in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. James is all about doers of the word. Don't be a hearer, be a doer. Like I said in the first study, if a deaf person moved into your house, would he be able to know, he or she would be able to know if you're a Christian or not? That's the challenge. Without any words, would you be able to convince them that you are a true believer? Without any words. Can't say hallelujah, can't say praise the Lord, can't turn on K-Wave, can't do anything. You have to do it. You have to behave and act like the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you be able to do it? That's what James is. James is about, okay, you have faith. Show me your faith by what you, be, what, what, what you do. Show me your faith by your work. Show me your faith by your behavior. Could you convince a deaf person that you are a Christian if you had no words to use? That's the challenge. And so James says, doers, do the word. And he corrects us when he says, don't do this. There's a lot of do, do this, and there's a lot of don'ts. Don't do this. We have one in verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, do not, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Sergio, is Sergio back there? Can you give me a water? Can Sergio give me a water? I, I all of a sudden feel like a, a camel in the, in the Sinai, just completely dry. James is very good for us, by the way. A lot of people don't like the book of James because it's, it's very pointed and very straight, and there's a lot of do's and don'ts, but he's good for us. Thank you, brother. Because he wants us to be faithful. James wants us to be faithful. You notice how he uses the word Faith. Thank you, brother. He uses the word faith, even in verse 1. You can translate it faithfulness. Faithfulness. God wants us to have faith. God wants us to be faithful. Why? Because our, from our faith, our faith is like a fountain that would release good works in our lives. Remember, faith is like a fountain. Think of faith as a fountain, a fountainhead which will spew out, which will come out, great good works, good works unto God. But we start with faith. 
and it produces the good works, which James says, that's what God wants to see. God wants to see fruit. God wants to see the good works in our lives. Why? Because it is a result of our faith. So if you have faith, how do you know you have faith? You know, he's going to get to Abraham later and, and Rahab. How do you know they have faith? I mean, Abraham had faith, but it wasn't until 20 years later, until he was tested, until he's shown that he truly had faith, and that's what James focuses on. He had faith in Genesis 15, but when was it tested? When was it really shown that he truly had faith? That's right, the offering of Isaac, 20 years later or so, maybe later. He was shown to be faithful, and that's what James focuses on. He doesn't focus on Genesis 15 or Genesis 12, where it was accounted for him for righteousness. He focuses on the act of faith, which he had when he offered up his own son. And so that's what God is after. How do you know you have faith? Wouldn't it be evident? Wouldn't it come out? Is it a fountainhead that brings forth the good works that God has called us to, be, to do? Well, this is what James is about. And so remember in the section before, in chapter 1, there is a series of discussions on the poor and the rich. And this is, uh, this is right off the bat in chapter 2. He says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, with an attitude of personal favoritism. If a man comes into your synagogue who's rich, what are you going to do? And another one comes into your synagogue, and he's poor. What are you going to do? And he, in from chapter 1, we're told that uh, there was a great disparity between poor and the rich, even among the Jews. Remember, it's written to Jews. It's written to the first century Christian Jews. They were a great disparity, rich and poor. How did that happen? Because when the Jews came back from exile, only 50,000 of them came back, by the way, in the book of Nehemiah, Ezra, we're studying Nehemiah with the men. The rest of the Jews stayed in exile from Babylon, from Assyria. They didn't want to come back. Why? They made a lot of money. They were merchants, they were traders, they were commerce. They, were, they didn't want to come back. They said, we're making a lot of money. Why don't we go back to that dry, thirsty land called Jerusalem? We're going to stay and make money here. We're going to be merchants, we're going to be commerce, we're going to run the banks. And so when you get into the New Testament, a lot of them were still in exile. Acts 2, it tells us that there were Jews from everywhere, from Rome, from Pamphylia, from Phrygia. There was from, from everywhere. And we're told in the first century there was a great disparity. Rich Jews, poor Jews. And God had warned them in the Old Testament not to forget the poor, not to destitute the poor, not to uh, put the poor in injustice. But they were, good, they were good at doing that. And you know what? It happened in the New Testament as well. And that's what James is talking about, the poor and the rich. And it also happened to Christians. <laughs> this is why James is talking. About it. it could happen to us. Now, I want to go back to verse 27, because it's a, it's a continuous letter, right? It's a continual thought, even though we're starting chapter 2. Look at verse 27 of chapter 1. He says, this is true and undefiled religion, pure and undefiled religion, in the sight of our God and Father, to visit the orphans, widows in distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And he goes on to chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, don't hold your faith in our glorious Lord, as something to do with favoritism, as an attitude of favoritism. Why is he talking about that? Because favoritism, it's an attitude that we can have and it's being tainted by the world. That's what he's trying to say. We are tainted by the world when we have favoritism. Now, in general, I want to talk about in general. In general, this is true. There are times, and we're going to talk about that in, in detail, there are times where... Uh, James is going to talk about the poor and the rich, and he's going to say the rich do this and the poor do this, but that's in general. Not all rich people that are rich uh, uh, are lost, right? They, some of them have faith. It's harder. And not all poor people have faith. There are those who are bitter and angry that they're, that they're poor and they do not have faith. But in general, this is what happens. This is what James is talking about. In general, this is going to happen that the poor are going to be more open to the gospel because of their current condition, and the rich are not going to be aware of their spiritual condition, and they're going to not hear the gospel because they have so much wealth around them. In general, that happens, and that's what I have to qualify because it's not in every case. Paul says in Corinthians that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the poor things of this world. Why? 
because God gives favor to the poor, gives favor to those who are destitute. He didn't choose many nobles, many rich, many wise, according to this world, right? So God can get the glory. Now, it says many, not any, right? Many, not many wise, not many rich, not many wise to this world, not many rich in this world. And I remember a story of Queen Elizabeth from England who says, I was saved by an M. I was saved by an M. I was like, what do you say by an M? Because it says not many noble. It says it doesn't say not any noble, not many noble. She's a believer. She was a believer in Christ Jesus. It says not many noble. Thank God it was an M, not any, many, not many noble. She was one of them. Not many rich, not many wise according to this world. Why? Because God takes pleasure in giving favor to those who are nothing in this world. He chooses the foolish things of this world. And so partiality. Let's go to the, oh, you're there. Thank you. The rich and the poor. Don't combine favoritism with faith. That's the point of the first few verses. Just because they start with F, it's not the same thing. Favoritism and faith is not the same thing. Don't combine them. It's worldly, and it could happen to the church. Let's go to the first slide, or the second slide. The sin of partiality. Don't deny your faith in Jesus by being partial, by showing favorites. It's easy to do. It happens in churches. It even happens here. It even happens here. But don't deny your faith in the Lord. It talks about faith. It talks about favoritism. Why? Because, he says, when two people come in, verse 2, into your assembly. By the way, he uses the word synagogue. And we talked about that. This is what it means. Why does he use the word synagogue? Because in the early church, mostly all believers were Jews. The Gentiles were coming in in a trickle. And then later on, after chapter 10, they came in in a torrent. They became in, uh, by the floodgates. But the early church met in synagogues by the temple. They met together in homes. And the word synagogue just simply means an assembly of people. I love that because it doesn't focus on the building. It focuses on the people. That's what church is. Ecclesia, right? That's another word that is used for the assembly of believers. Called out ones. It's not the building. It's the people. It's the assembly, the assembly of believers. This is an assembly. This is a gathering. Where's a gather? It doesn't matter. We're assembling together. It's a synagogue. We're coming together. When you come together and there's a rich man comes in and there is a poor man comes in, you make a visible reaction and you take the poor and you say, ha, huh, or let's take the rich. Oh, rich, sit right here. You get a good view of the pastor. You have a good, you want some water? Oh, come on in. Uh, Serge, you get some water. You know, Roy gets it. Look who's here. And it's, and then the poor person comes in, and it's like, um, we're full. <laughs> well, there's chairs. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can have the one in the back. Sit next to Gabby. Or sit next to Melissa in the back today, right? Go in the back, right? Or he says, look, what is this? It says, stand right here, sit on the floor next to my footstool. Why do they do that? Uh, James says, you just sinned. You just sinned against the Lord by showing favoritism. What's your attitude toward the outsiders will be the attitude toward the insiders. What you reflect on the outs to outsiders coming in, imagine a new person coming into the fellowship, and you go, oh, I'll sit over here. You're rich. You're good. Can we get this guy to tithe? We can really have the things that we need, right? And the poor is like, well, I don't need that guy who has any, anything to give. Put him in the back. Favoritism. And that's the attitude you'll have toward people in the fellowship. You will only want to hang out with those who can give you stuff. Those who can, you get something out of them. And that's the favoritism. Now listen, the Bible uh, tells us a lot of things about our behavior and fellowship. One thing it tells us, don't be cliquish. Don't be cliquish. Do you realize that's a major, major sin in the church? Never, never talked about it. We don't really talk about it. Why? Because it's a hush-hush and everybody's doing it. And if you talk about it, oh goodness, Someone's not going to come back next week. The Bible says don't be cliquish. This is what's talking about favoritism. Now, it's talking about favoritism to the rich and the poor. Can you imagine? Do people really in, in churches fellowship with only those that they like? Only those that they feel like they can get something out of them? Oh, you know, if I go to lunch with Joel, he might buy me lunch. You know, if I go to lunch with Bill, you know, he might like me a little bit more, and you know, maybe he'll give to the church a little bit more. And don't think that doesn't happen in any ministry. 
there is a favoritism toward those who give the most, who are capable of giving the most. That's why I don't really care what people give. I have no clue what people give. You might be the best, the best giver in the church, and I wouldn't have a clue. Or you must be the, maybe you don't give at all. You can't. And I wouldn't have a clue. Why do I do that? Because I don't want to enter even my mind, because I know how we could be. Hey, man, if that guy leaves, boy, we're not going to be able to do the children's ministry anymore. You know, if that person doesn't come, I, we may lose it all, right? And we began to show favoritism. Even with, it's gross, it's sick, it's disgusting, but it's real, and it happens. So James says, look, I'm going to put my finger in something that happens every Sunday, or at least a tendency to happen every Sunday, that you would be cliquish, that you would show favoritism. You see a rich person, he'll sit right here next to me, we'll have lunch, we'll go out, and then the poor person, I, that guy can't get anything out of that guy. Sit in the back, sit on the floor, <laughs> go to the next church, we're full. And it continues. Now he says, you pay, you pay special attention to them, and it's, God, and it's ungodly. And why is it ungodly? It's a mistake, but why is it ungodly? Um, I'll give you this reason. Verse 1. See the word glory there? My brethren, do not hold the faith into our glorious Lord. Faith of our glorious Lord. What is the glory of Christ? What makes the glory, I mean, what makes Jesus so glorious? Think about that in your faith. What makes him so glorious? What's so amazing that we talk about our Lord Jesus Christ? What did he do before the cross? Think about it before the cross. All right, here's creator. But what did our creator do that was so glorious that the Bible says, this is amazing. Like, you have to put this on your mind to actually think about it. Yeah, that's right. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. I'll read it to you. You can turn to with me, but I, I got to read it really quick because I, I tend to go long. And uh, no, come on. Are you serious? Second Corinthians 8 9 says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, if you think that's talking about money, you uh, get an F. And hermeneutics, you get an F in how you understand the Bible. That does not talking about money. Does God use money for himself? Nope. Is there money in heaven? Nope. Why is he saying that Jesus Christ was rich and he became poor? He is talking about his condition in heaven. Was he rich? Yes, yes he was. He owns everything. He's glorious. And what did he do? He became poor. poor. You read the Gospels. He became a son of a peasant. God could have chosen anybody, anybody on this earth. He could have chosen to be born, for his son to be born, the Messiah, on this earth. He picked the poorest. How do you know they were poor? Well, many reasons, culturally. But you know when they, they brought, um, uh, Joseph and Mary brought uh, turtle doves. And they go, well, what does that, as a sacrifice. Well, that was the sacrifice of a poor person. They couldn't even afford a lamb. They couldn't afford a sacrifice. They had to bring turtle doves, and they had to wash it over the, you know, the blood of the water in, all in the Old Testament. It was a significant. It was, they were poor, and God chose to have his son in the most poor country, in the most oppressive country because of the Romans, and Jesus became one of us so that in his poverty, as he came down, he would redeem us, and we would become rich in faith in him, and that's why he came down. So that's the glory of Christ. The glory of Christ is that he humbled himself, he emptied himself, and he became like us. That's the glory of Christ, right? We understand that. Amen? Amen? Okay. That's what it took to save us. That's what it took to redeem us. That's what it took for the God of this universe, the creator of the universe, to become the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of the lowest so that you would inherit salvation and everything he has, it will be yours in the kingdom of Jesus. That's what it took. That's the glory of Christ. And so if you know what glory is, why are you so focused on the phony glory of a rich person? That's what James is trying to say. Why are you favoritism? Why are you favoring phoniness? <laughs> if we know that the glory of the, of the, the real glory is humbling yourself, 
The real glory is imitating Jesus. The real glory is him becoming a man. Why do you so enamored, pop-eyed, toward a rich person who comes in? You should just go, oh, man, he's rich. We're so sorry. It's hard for you to enter heaven, isn't it? Sit in the back and learn something. <laughs> you know? That, that, you know, you say, well, that's, who would do that? But you know what? That's really the attitude that the scripture tells us to have. We should love them. I'm not saying not, not love them, but we should go, oh, he's rich. Hi, oh, Vey. It, it's going to get, it's, we need to pray for him. He's rich. <laughs> and he may not be saved. Sit next to Lynette. Yeah. He might not be saved, right? He is rich. Oh. And then a poor person comes in, we should say, hallelujah, this man is close to the kingdom. He could see it, he could taste it, he could grab it. He is going to grab the kingdom by force. Why? He's close. He's rich in faith. Why? God favors him. Oh, come on in, brother, come on in. I'm assuming someone's going to go, what is wrong with this church? <laughs> you know, they have it all backwards. Actually, we have it all right if we did that, right? Why? Because God says he favors the rich. Look what it says in verse 4. You have made a distinction among yourselves. You become judges with evil motives. You actually have made a distinction based on the appearance of a man. And you are sitting there like a judge saying, I'm going to treat that guy nice. I'm not going to treat that guy nice. I'm going to treat her nice. I'm not going to treat her nice. She lives here. Good. She lives there. Huh. And you become this disparity, this, this awful distinction, this awful prejudice toward the poor. And why shouldn't it be about the poor? Because of this. Um, let's go to the next slide. It's actually a mistake. It's actually a mistake. Listen, my brethren, verse 5. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Like I said, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, Paul says that God has chosen the foolish things, the poor things, the abased things, the humble things of this world to confine the wise. Why? See, this, this attitude, the, the point is this attitude toward the poor tells you a lot about your heart. This attitude toward the rich tells you a lot about your heart. It's all about faith, right? That's what he said. Your faith, don't mix favoritism with your faith. Why? Because when you favoritism, when you have favoritism, it shows something about your faith. Remember I told you that it's, it's faith, show me your faith by your works? Well, what kind of work is that about your faith when you're favoring people, when you forget the real glory, it's humbling yourself. That's what Jesus did. Why are you so focused on the glory that's phony, the rich, that's passing away? All right? Tells you a lot about your faith, doesn't it? When you focus on the riches of this world. Where's your faith, man? Where's your faith? You're putting all your stock and barrel on this world. Look at that rich guy. You think he's so cool because he's rich. And in reality, he's poor. In reality, he's heading for bankruptcy. But the poor, you don't really care. Even though, God says, he is rich in faith. God chooses the poor, and this is about grace, the choosing of God. What do you believe about grace? What do I believe about grace? I believe about grace that God chose me before I chose him. I believe about grace that is undeserved, that I could not earn it or work for it. It is simply God's choosing to have grace toward me. I couldn't make it happen. He did it. He chose. There's an old poem that says, how odd for God to, chose, to choose the Jews. How odd of God to choose the Jews. They were the poorest of the nations. They were slaves. Better off choosing the Egyptians or the Canaanites or the you know, Amorites. They were powerful, strong people. Why did he choose a bunch of peasants? So the, the, the poem goes, how odd of God to choose the Jews. And it, and it finishes with how more odd <laughs> of people who choose the God of the Jews and scorn the Jews. <laughs> it's a nice poem. It's a short poem. That's it. That's all it says. How odd of God to choose the Jews, but more odd of people who choose the God of the Jews but scorn the Jews. 
<laughs> talk about anti-Semitism in the church. We love the Jewish God, the God of Israel, but we tell to the Jews, oh, forget it, you're not chosen anymore. How odd is that? More odd, <laughs> right? But God chose the weak things, the foolish things, starting with who? The Jews. Who would have chosen them? Nobody, <laughs> except God. Can you imagine that? God chose a bunch of peasants, poor people, bricklayers. They were just slaves. And he made them into this nation. And now he says, I choose you by grace. Undeserved. I mean, the biggest mystery in the Bible is how I got saved. Seriously, that's the, you want to know the biggest mystery in the Bible is how I got saved. How I'm still saved. <laughs> how did God do that? It's a total mystery. Think about it. Think about who you were before Christ. And God, I wouldn't have chosen me. I, seriously, I would have been not me. But you know what? It's not up to me. It's up to his grace. He chooses the humble things, the poor things. And he's talking about those who recognize that are poor. Here's the, poor, here's the important part. Even though you're rich, you know, materially, you can see yourself as poor, as a sinner, and you realize that you have nothing. And that's when God says, oh, yes, I choose you. Because you have nothing. <laughs> you finally recognize you have nothing. Without me, you can't do nothing. We need him. So, okay, so if God chooses the humble things, the poor things, the, this is grace. It's a total grace. Why do you go around and spurn that grace by choosing to be favored over Choosing a, a, you know, favoritism to the rich over those who are of humble means, to those who are poor. Don't you just violate a grace? Now you're choosing something that God would not have done. Now you're choosing something opposite of grace. Now you're picking. <laughs> and you're actually dishonoring the poor that are rich in faith. And that's, look what it says. But you have dishonored the poor men. Is it not the rich who oppress you personally and drag you into courts? How did God choose me? His grace? That should be our outlook for the church. Is we don't care how much money you have. We just care that you love Jesus. We just care that you come and build each other up and build up our faith and, and strengthen each other. That's really the point. But by choosing favorites, by having favorites, you're now denying the grace of God. And you're saying, well... I choose something different than what God would do. <laughs> you know, God chooses the poor. I chose the rich because they give me stuff and I can get stuff from them. Uh, God chooses the humble, but I'm going to choose that guy who's really arrogant, but he's got money. And all of a sudden, you invert the grace of God. Now, your favoritism denies the very thing that you believe. That's what James is saying. If he was here, he said, how can you do that? How can you believe in grace and just choose the, the rich over the poor? It doesn't make any sense. Doesn't the rich drag you to court? Think about this for a moment. Who persecutes Christians? Who takes us to court? Who drags down the Ten Commandments? Who passes laws against uh, you know, biblical Christianity? Is it the poor? No. Who is it? The rich. The, rich, the elite. Congressmen and congresswomen, and does it make any sense <laughs> to, to favor the rich who are the ones responsible for the persecution of Christians around the world, especially here? Why would you do that? Don't they drag you to court? I mean, if to make a lot of money in this world, to make a lot of money, I'm not talking about small money, to make a lot of money, there's an element of crookedness. There's an element of crookedness. How do I say that? In our world, to make lots of money, George Soros money, that type of money, you have to raise yourself up and put others down. Right? Hedge, hedge funds, hedge betting, right? You bet against the currency of another country to, be, to bring your profits up. So you make money, they don't. They actually are poor. And, and then James says, why are you favoring that? Don't blaspheme. Don't they blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? Verse 7. Don't they blaspheme that? Don't the rich really are the ones against Christianity, against the Bible, against our Lord? 
Why do we have this thing in our hearts that we will favor them? Because we are tainted by the world. We've been tainted by the world. Remember, God frees us. And in verse 8, we're going to finish just in a few moments. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality and are committing sin, we are convicted by the law and are a trans as a transgressor, a lawbreaker. For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles in one point has become guilty. Now this is what it's saying. Think about this for a moment. Grace comes before law, right? Grace comes before law. Before there was Mount Sinai, there was the Passover lamb. Amen? Everybody got that? Before there was Mount Sinai, there was the blood of the lamb. Before there was the, 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 the giving of the law, there was a shedding of blood. Grace comes first. Amen? Amen. The biggest portion of the law is the sacrificial system, Leviticus. The biggest portion of the Torah is the fact that you cannot keep it. And God has to atone for your sins. Think about that for a moment. It's like, oh, that's right. How the law, even though the law is a law of sin and death, and we cannot keep it, the biggest portion of it, it says, you can't keep it, there's a blood atonement for you. If you turn to it, if you receive it, there's a blood atonement for you. However, once we have it, the Bible says, once we have salvation, the Bible says, stay free by obeying the Lord. Stay free by obeying the Lord. The point of grace is not to just let you do whatever you want and your lust and whatever you want to do and, and, and your sins. Grace is to free us to now come under Christ and be free from the world and from our lust and from our sin. That's what he talks about the law now. You don't find it interesting? He just begins to talk about the law. Now, he mentions the royal law. That royal law, the word simply means the law of the king, the law of the kingdom. You can become, un, you now are becoming under the law of the king, the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to give us liberty, he says in there, the law of liberty. Do you know what Jesus, what God did to Israel? He freed us. He freed Israel from all the sins that they have committed, and he brought them to the, the promised land. And he says, now you want to stay free? Follow me. Here's my law. There is no worse bondage than sin. Now, they didn't say they want to go back. They, they did say they want to go back to Pharaoh, but they, they weren't planning on going back to Pharaoh under those conditions. God was freeing them from something much worse than Pharaoh. Sin. Do you want to know what bondage is? Look at the Ten Commandments, right? And we go, man, it's like, man, it's kind of hard. It's kind of, you know, restrictive. People think of the Ten Commandments. Restrictive. They're not letting me do what I want. But it's really freedom. That's what James is talking about. It's the law of the king. It is the freedom. It is the liberty. You want to know what freedom is? Follow Jesus. You want to know what bondage is? Go to the world and do the opposite of the Ten Commandments. There is no more bondage, no more, or there's no worse bondage than sexual immorality. You're bound to it. Pornography, you're bound to it. Adultery, you're bound to it. Lying, cheating, stealing. You want, that? You want to know what bondage is like? Just do that. There's no worse taskmaster than sin. Jesus said that. You're a slave to sin. Now, the, the Jews had a chance to be free from that. I'll give you my law. Be free. The law of liberty. Love your neighbor as yourself, which is the whole point of the law, isn't it? The whole point of the law is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. So it says if you show partiality, you're actually violating God's law. Why is he talking about law? Because the law of God remains the same, doesn't it? The law didn't change. You read the law in the Old Testament, still the same. It hasn't changed. Who changes? Me. Which was once the law of sin and death who now said, you're guilty of sin, you broke God's law, you deserve death, punishment. That's what the law tells us. Grace comes in and he says, you're forgiven by the atonement of the Messiah, by faith and repentance, you could be born again. 
Now follow him. And now we look at the law, not as a law of sin and death anymore. We look at the law and say, that's how we love God. Now, isn't, isn't the law boils down to love, right? That's what Paul said in Romans. If you want to keep the law, what do you have to do? Love. Love who? Love God. And I have to love you. And you have to love me. How do we do that? Read the first five commandments. Shall not have no other God before me. You know what the worst, the, the worst bondage you can be in? It's, it's idolatry. Idolatry. Go worship the God of Islam. Then you really have bondage now. Go worship the God of the Hindus. Really in, <laughs> in trouble now. In slavery, right? But with the, when you love God, there's a liberty now. So the law now becomes a, a teaching tool for me. I have to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I, I, I'm not going to have any other God. I'm not going to take his name in vain. I'm not going to blaspheme his name. I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to love my wife. I'm going to not commit adultery. I'm, why? Because I love my God and I love my neighbor. Why does it bring up this point? Do you know what the, the, the point is? The, the, the people in the congregation that were showing partiality were saying, well, we're showing love to the rich men. We have to show love to the rich. It says, love your neighbor. And we're loving him. I said, but you're loving him. You're showing partiality because you're not loving the poor person. And you're violating God's law. And it says, if you're guilty of breaking it in one point, you're guilty of the whole law. You're breaking the whole law. Why? Because God's law is indivisible. God's law is like a mirror. God's law is like if you break a little piece of that mirror, doesn't the whole thing shatter? It's no good anymore. <laughs> it's not like you can take a little piece here and a little piece there. That's how sometimes people see the law. They go, well, oh, I never committed adultery. Think about this for a moment. 600, oh, I'm done. 613 laws in the, in the Old Testament, right? 613 as a covenant, as a relationship to the Jewish people. 613. How many do you think are in the New Testament? Anybody have a wild guess? There are laws in the New Testament? Oh, yes, they are. There are do's and don'ts in the New Testament, aren't they? Commands? How many do you think there are? Anybody want to guess? This usually shocks Christians because they're like, we're not under law. What are you talking about, under law? What? Huh? No. No? 1,100 of do's and don'ts in the New Testament. Do you realize one thing? And I'm going to get in trouble. But do you realize one thing? Isn't the, isn't, you take, look at Moses' law. That's pretty hard, right? It's almost impossible. It's like, who can live that? But you can look what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll do that one. See how you measure up to that one. Jesus' standard is higher than Moses' law. People don't even think about it that way. Jesus, Moses said, don't do this, don't do that, you know, behavior. Jesus said, if you even think about it, it's a sin. Ooh, Nelly, now you're in trouble. Ooh, that's right. I'd like to talk to people about, you know, you know when sharing the gospel. Them, I, man, I, I keep, I'm a good person. I keep the Sermon on the Mount, you know. Really? <laughs> you do? Oh, my goodness. Hey, get some water over here, guys. Let's see if he can walk on it. I never met anybody that could. Really? You can keep the Sermon on the Mount? And obviously you start teaching them. I'm not mocking them, but it's like, wow, amazing. Can you keep this one? Oh, no. You ever thought about a woman like that? Oh, yes. And automatically began to disperse all these things that they've broken the law. The law of liberty. Liberty is to follow Jesus. Liberty is to be free from sin. That's what he says. You breaking the law? I'll leave you with this. I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, think about this for a moment. Think of, of, you bought a brand new car. Anybody bought a brand new car before? Anybody bought a new Okay. I have only once or twice maybe. And imagine you get an instruction manual with this book, with this, with this car, and it says, put gasoline only in the car. And you huff. Huh! Gasoline in the car? I need to be free 
to put whatever I want in the car. This restriction is so awful. Gas in the car? I should be able to put water. Banana peels, much cheaper than gas. Do you know what the car was made to have? Gasoline. Do you know as humans, we're created in God's image and likeness. When we become born again, we become imitators of God. The law brings us under his law, under his grace, under his rulership, right? The law says, hey, grace brought you there. The law says, now this is what God is like. It's, here's a reflection of God. Now he says, imitate him now. And because of his grace, we're able by love to keep it. It's an amazing thing. If you just focus on loving God and loving others. And now you say, well, I'm not restricted by the law. The law actually teaches me about God. The law actually teaches me about how to love other people. Do you see what happened? The law never changed. The law did not, it's still the same thing. But my attitude toward the law, my view toward the law, me has changed toward the law. And now I'm not afraid of the law. I look at the law and go, how holy, how good, how righteous it is. And it teaches me to love God. And for that, I give him praise. And it says, mercy. Verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. And actually, mercy, it's the opposite of what they were doing. Because if you're going to show mercy, you should have merciful to, be merciful toward everyone, not show favorites. So by the fact that you favor people shows a lack of mercy. And that's what he says. You want to have mercy, be merciful. If you want God to be merciful to you, Show mercy, right out of the Sermon on the Mount. Why? Because mercy triumphs over judgment. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul says. You want God to be merciful to you? Be merciful. Don't show favorites. You are being tainted by the world. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace. And Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, and we repent tonight of favoritism that we have towards some people and the denial of other people. Just because, Lord, we have become cliquish or we become favorites toward one over another. Lord, it's not right. It is not true, and it's, it's denying grace. It's denying glory. Your true glory is denying mercy. It's breaking your law. And Lord, forgive us. And teach us, Lord, how to be merciful to all. How to realize true glory is your glory. It's humility. It's brokenness. True grace is that you chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Lord, we have so much to learn. Please keep this fellowship from being a place where favoritism rules, but rather a place where faith is the rule. Faith in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for James's message. Change us, Lord. Change our attitude toward the poor and toward the rich. In Jesus' name, amen.